Good morning, one and all, and welcome to another episode in our JBDC concert series, where we seek to share critical information with the creative industries and have topical discussions around topics that are really buzzing in the global space to ensure that we stay current and come up with some collective ideas and solutions to move our local fashion um, and apparel industry today. And so today we will be talking about bespoke in an online world, cut to fit. And let me just share some highlights of what is taking place in the industry as we speak. The global apparel market, of course, encompasses clothing from fashion wear, from sportswear, sorry, to business wear, to value clothing and statement luxury pieces. After difficulties in 2020 during the COVID pandemic, of course, we saw major hits taking place in retail. And of course, that would have filtered into the fashion and apparel industry. However, there's still a dominant presence of this industry with the global market estimated at $1.5 trillion in 2021 and is predicted to have an increase of up to approximately 2 trillion by 2026. And so we have been given a, a trajectory for a couple of years in the train for us to still make some adjustments, catch up, do whatever we need to do to ensure that we are tapping into this $2 trillion global industry. We can't have a market that size and not ensure that Jamaica is at least getting its share of that market space. And of course, we would have been able to identify that the US market and China are both generating substantially high revenues in in terms of their consumption of outputs in this industry, with the export value in, from China being 154 billion and in the US 1.5 trillion. So given the global context, our local fashion industry now, the fashion industry in Jamaica is bursting with talent and innovation Many new design companies have been founded during the past decade, each selling high quality clothing and accessories. Simultaneously, several Jamaican models have revolutionized the fashion world. Like most industries, however, the local fashion industry was severely impacted by COVID. With the major feeder of our local fashion and apparel industry being the entertainment sector, now, of course, we would have seen some fest coming on stream and the, the carnival coming on stream. So the entertainment industry is definitely demonstrating some bouncing back and some reviving. How is the fashion industry responding? Is it reviving in the same way? Were we ready to open back up business? And so we're gonna have a little discussion around what is this new context that we are operating in? We are looking at the online world and in the same way that the online world would have opened up the market to Jamaican designers and fashion producers, they are also, it's also opening up the world to our local consumers and these very market segments that were feeding us before. And is there a challenge here are these local, these local um, consumers consuming more imports than what we are producing locally? So we're going to look at the dynamics of how the online revolution has impacted the industry and what are some of the things that we need to pay attention to to make sure that we are back in alignment if we are out of alignment. However, before we get into the heart of the matter and before I introduce my esteemed panelists, I want to just ask our CEO, Ms. Valivier, to just give us our, our welcome. Thank you, Janine, and um, welcome everybody to another of our forums, which is where we really explore together and share information. 
And it speaks volumes because we have put fashion under in concert umbrella because we acknowledge that it is part of the creative industries. And that's important for us. Now, this industry, and maybe I'm older than many of you, has been one of our strong traditional industries. It has gone through bounces here and so on, 807 and all of that. And we have seen the impact of each phase. As Janine, said, Janine says, is this now a robust activity at this time? And I guess we'll explore that during the whole course of the discussion. But I think that we have not really developed many of the opportunities that exist within the umbrella of fashion and zone products and accessories. So there is a lot of opportunities. And what's interesting for us at JBDC is that there are opportunities for all sizes of operations to come into the story. And you know, MSMEs is really who we are mainly focused on. And there's an opportunity depending on where you land yourself to be able to develop your business and to really do well. So we are, we are hoping that coming from the discussions, we'll identify some of those nodules. And in fact, fashion exists, opportunities exist along with every, almost every other sector. If it's tourism, there's a whole possibility for fashion in terms of uniforms and so on. Even church, people don't recognize that church is another fashion opportunity that we have not even begun to explore. And there are many, many, many other such sports. You know, our people demonstrated even more forcefully in the last um, World Games that fashion was the thing. What next um, design was going to be coming on the field? So the opportunities are vast. And I am looking forward myself to the discussion and the contribution of all our um, panelists and to see at the end of the period, which I know Jan is going to um, control and guide throughout efficiently as usual, we're going to come out with some valuable lessons and valuable opportunities that we can pursue to bring back full life because I think we're in that kind of period and as you say, online, what's there that we can do in that sphere. So I'm excited and looking forward to some serious um, discussion this morning. And I thank all of you for joining us this morning and looking forward to a robust discussion. Under your guidance, Jan. Thank you, Ms. V. As usual, we are really appreciative of your passion for the MSN sector. And so we are always looking to your leadership to move and stand on behalf of the MSMEs. Um, I don't believe I'd introduce myself. I am Janine Fletcher Taylor. I think I was so excited to get started. I am Janine Fletcher Taylor, the manager of the marketing services unit here at JBDC. And with me this morning are our guest panelists. Um, beginning with Mr. O Mr. Robert Hall, our own internal family member here. Robert is in charge of the fashion department at JBDC here, and he's also a fashion designer in his own right. And Robert will be taking us through um, a discussion on influencers and influences, new trends in fashion post COVID-19. With us, we also have Mrs. Kenya Linton George, who is a fashion designer and owner of her own Kenya Linton Boutique. And Kenya will be taking us through the road to recovery, reigniting old talent for new business. We also have Mrs. Miriam Hines Smith, Dean at the School of the Visual Arts at the Edna Manley College of Arts. And Miriam will be taking us through the future of the fashion, future of fashion. Can the fashion industry survive cheap imports and mass labeling? Huge, huge topic. And to tie this, tie us off in this discussion, we also have Mrs. Laura Lee Jones, who is also from the Edna Manley School of Visual and Performing Arts. 
and Laura will be talking us through the bespoke aspect of this discussion and preparing the next generation, the future of our fashion industry. And so without any further ado, I will be handing this discussion over to the panelists um, who are better able to take us through this dialogue, starting with Mr. Robert Hall. And let me just give you a little bit of background on Robert. So Robert Hall is a designer on staff at JBDC currently, as a part of our technical services team, he is a part of the creative industries as well as a lecturer in his own right. He's also lecturing at the Edna Manley College, sorry, of visual and performing arts while being engaged as a consultant in numerous Jamaican brands. He has presented a myriad of workshop sessions covering topics around design and pioneering programs to evolve new generations of Jamaican design. Robert, please tell us about influencers and influences and new trends in fashion post COVID. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, are you hearing me clearly, John? Yes, I am. Okay, excellent. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to even share in this public um, discussion you know, where we really can um, explore, you know, our state post COVID and just where it is that we're going and what are probably the, the particular pathways and highlights that we need to be looking at in essence. Um, so just for my presentation, um, I want to, you know, and as, as we all are aware, we live in a, we exist as an industry within a global kind of a, um, ecosystem. Right. Um, but I think one of the key issues is that we need to understand. And I think what's going to be important for us post COVID is something that we've constantly said, and it's something that we've been trying to do, I would say, since our independence, you know, even as we're on the cusp of celebrating 60, um, this issue of almost establishing ourselves as a force and separate. We have to um, remind ourselves that we are culturally strong. And again, you know, thanks to um, the world championships, you know, um, just being a space that we could all just call this around. We are reminded of our greatness as a culture. So even just by ourselves, we are a great culture and it's no time, it's full time that we literally convert that, um, that dominance and that greatness now into something that basically benefits us across the world in terms of economy as a mass on a macro scale as well as individually. And so as we think about moving into this, this period post COVID, um, and we talk about trends. I think one of the things that we have to really begin to anchor is that issue of bespoke. Um, so the thing is that the bespoke or the custom part of the of the industry is something that we that the that international is not something that basically it's very expensive to run and it's something that's not offered across the board with everybody else. However, this is something that is culturally, why is it now attached to us? And it is now, we need to understand it as our advantage because what is happening in terms of trends internationally is that even though we're going back to, let's say, or, or, or going back to supposed their level of normalcy, what we have to understand now is that because of the issue of one inclusion, um, in our words, the industry is picking up from where it was you know, um, let's say pre-COVID. So some of the, the same issues of the green economy um, being, being the focus as in issues of um, environmental awareness being very important. That of um, inclusion, fair trade and justice, all of these now have now become, um, moved from just being, let's say, flange new um, elements to really being center of fashion. And so now in terms of environmental focus, what you find is that there are a lot of um, that now translates into um, upcycling and a very high awareness of, let's say, the kind of fabrication that you're using to actually manifest your designs. And so what is happening now is that an easy entry point for persons is usually there's a lot of recycling that is happening in fashion. And so now you're there, you're saying you're, you're seeing where from very small designers to also um, larger luxury labels were actually incorporating um, upcycling, you know, um, upcycling, recycling programs as a part of the way that they fabricate a collection and develop um, design ideas. And so what that now says to us is that whereas before, you know, it was now seen as, oh, you can't replicate this design or I can't guarantee you the quality in this design because of that. That is now being accepted as norm. And so you have brands like Marine Serre 
who um she's a new designer and basically she sells on the luxury label and you see where it is understood that she's actually using upcycled uh, material and so that is accepted as a, as a part of design as i said as you look across the fashion weeks you definitely see that whole um that pattern in terms of how it is things that are fabricated and that nuance or, or that that tolerance for the difference in the different pieces that actually not being allowed also because of the so that whole trend of um let's say that the 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 necessity for originality and and even within the context of a collection that basically is um, where we're replicating an idea there's a no a, a higher toler tolerance and acceptance of difference and people now wanting to look different and so again no we're in a space now where things that we are used to locally of going to the fabric store and only finding x amount of fabric or x amount of raw material is now accepted in terms of i can have a collection that I can now fabricate with shades of difference as I move through the collection. That is not accepted across the board in terms of um, design. Um, the issue of uh, gender fluidity um, is something that's big internationally, locally. It is, um, you know, so, so basically what we have happening now is that there's less of the kind of, oh, it needs to be strictly feminine, strictly, strictly, um, strictly male. But no, it's more an issue of in terms of design, right? There's a lot more acceptance across the board of basically what we see as accepted design for both male and female. And as we see even in Jamaica, the men are as much peacocks as, as the women are. And so there's no not this thing of saying, oh, well, the, the men's clothes is going to be all boring and somber. We know that color is something across the board that even as Jamaicans we do. And it's something that basically we're beginning to open up to even internationally as seeing that look. It doesn't have to just be this or it just have to be that. Um, and of course, you now the issue of fair trade and justice um being again something that where is 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 a, is, a, is a focus international in terms of how are the clothes how is the clothing produced um is it something that is multiplying oppression is it something that is basically um you know done in a way that only a few people are benefiting but everybody else basically has to put themselves on the cross in a sense to actually get this stuff done so all in all we are in a situation where the the notes i know i'm probably speaking a little bit on what laura will be talking about but the notes of what is traditional to us as a people in terms of bespoke is something now that is not accepted across the board now let's pair that with the whole issue of digital now we now understand that what COVID did for us was that digital whereas before digital was seen in jamaica as just being something that all oh, the young people do oh they are the instagram ones Oh, they're the ones that, you know, as, as older person, we might get them and say, oh, you know, I don't really know how to do this, you know, we have this hype phone, but, oh, I don't really know how to use it. No, we now understand that digital, what COVID did for us was that it really allowed a lot of the excuses out of the things that they, they, the barriers that we had um, to this space, not actually coming down. The fact that, no, this is not accepted across the board and that in, in terms of like the fact that we're doing this forum online basically says to you again where this is no ubiquitous across the board. That being said, um, I think the challenge for us locally is that um, we understand that, yes, there is a hybrid version of, let's say, online selling that we do locally. And, you know, we've had the national experiments per se with the whole food issue where we have COVID and all that jazz. I would, what we now have to do as a people is that it is now time to fully embrace digital and we have to now start to innovate in terms of how it is that we use it and engage it to extend business. Um, we affirm the fact that even prior to COVID, there are lots of persons who are now using what I call a pseudo um, online selling mechanism that we developed here. Well, I wouldn't say locally, but then that people have developed within that online space where we use that, oh, you know, we post some picture and say, oh, I have three of this here. And people will now DM you and say, okay, how much is the price? And then you continue that transaction, whether on or offline and some versions of that, that mix. It is now time to actually um, standardize that. It's now time to actually centralize that particular, um, um, those approaches as in, we in our local in on in our in 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 a lot of the third world um you know developing spaces need to now begin to actually centralize digital and understand these are real spaces that we really can actually advance spaces like fashion um in terms of moving it forward because of course we know that even in the digital space there are no there are there are very little barriers so whereas before we really have had to travel to a trade show no people are just looking at anything on instagram or whatever and of course even internationally we understand that this, uh, because we're living so much of our lives online i mean we all were impacted by shelley's here 
you know, over um the the um the games the last 10 days. You know, and, and just to kind of impact every time she, she came out, we were just kind of looking out of, you know, um, what was she going to come with? And of course, that just kind of merged with the whole concept of the Dolly, you know, that was coming from the, the popular music space as well, too. We need to now understand that this is not just a space for play, but this is not a, a, a space where that kind of impact, because just as we were looking international, they were looking as well, too. We now need to understand that the digital space is legal space. We have to treat it like it's a mall. We have to treat it like it's actually um like literally shop space that you're renting that this is space now that we can begin to convert into space of value to actually move this industry space forward and as i said as i started before our dominance as a culture is something that is a given even if we don't want to admit it people like us people are into us people want to be us so it's now time to convert that and really begin to transfer this kind of space into that space of, um, you know, a value that moves from the macro to also the micro, the micro space. One thing I want to challenge us with, um, um, I know we've looked, we've, we've probably heard, you know, we're watching TV sometimes or cable or whatever, and there's a whole concept of stitch fix where you literally have a stylist in a box and you have, you sign up for this service, they take your measurements or whatever, and they they have this grid that they send to you and after a while they learn they literally learn your style and they send you stuff every every month now i pull that up because even as we think of digital and the kind of merge which i think is something that we have to even understand as a people where that whole issue thing of merging and bricolaging and um what is it no um that mix that we've always been doing is something that i think we need to look at again because again, even with the whole advantage that we have of bespoke and a custom, we have to start looking, is there a way that we can use a digital grid to actually convert this into something that all designers can use across the board? So I'll leave my comments right there. For kickstarting the conversation. And of course, I'm gonna ensure to invite our participants to Place your comments and your questions in the chat. They are being monitored so that when we get to the discussion part of the forum, we can understand what sort of questions and concerns you are generating through the discussion. I now invite um, Mrs. Keena Linton George, fashion designer and owner, to walk us through now the road to recovery and reigniting old talent for new business. And let me just give you a brief um, introduction here. Kina Linton George is a fashion designer and thriving young entrepreneur with extensive experience in television production and marketing. Um, Kina is committed to the advancement of the local fashion industry and has served as marketing officer for the fashion and apparel cluster some time ago, um, JBDC had that program which was funded by the EU. And so we understand that as a collective, we have a strong voice and some critical cross-cutting issues that would have come out of that group and continues to generate information for us here at JBDC. At present, Kina is the CEO of KTL Group Limited, a marketing and production company, and the host and executive producer of Mission Catwalk, a reality TV series aimed at discovering talent, fashion, talented fashion designers from across the Caribbean. So Kenya, I hand over to you to just, you know, add some meat to this discussion now on how we reignite old talent for new business. Oh, let me unmute. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. Um, for me, when I hear the discussions around fashion and reigniting old talent for new business or just our road to recovery. I am also a designer who is on the road to recovery since COVID because it was, it was a huge hit for the fashion industry globally. And we felt it in Jamaica because the lockdown was extensive. It carried over onto earlier on this year and without events, really a lot of local designers have no business, no business at all. If, if there's no church, no weddings, there is there's no business for our local designers because of fast fashion people can access clothing from anywhere and mainly you will find that it's occasion where where people will really look to local designers so for us we really struggled during covid and the road to recovery is is pretty steep because 
the landscape has changed so much and Robert um, touched on it. And I, I believe all persons on the panel will touch on this topic and it's sustainability because that's how much the, the narrative has shifted over the past decade. Now, for the last, for the, for the past two decades, we've seen the increase in terms of fast fashion and consumption. And it's, it is unbelievable what it's doing to the planet. And people are waking up to the reality that we can't continue this way. So for us, in terms of reigniting old talent for new business, we will have to look to the old skills that we have, look to the traditional craft and the artisans that used to you know, use sustainable methods of fashion. That is what we will have to go back to, to really be sustainable and to survive in this industry because it is, it is really tough to compete against fast fashion. And even though we're seeing a push against fast fashion, it's, 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 it's not going anywhere for now. It won't. And it's, it's a slow march toward sustainability. And until we can show where the money is in sustainable fashion, it is going to be a slow march. And we're seeing a, a, a small shift, but for our local designers, for us to capitalize on you know, growing our business and capitalize on sustainable fashion and slow fashion, we will have to go back to the artisanal um, craft and whether it's crochet, hand beading, embroidery, hand weaving for baskets and so forth, we will have to go back to, there are machines that can do that today, but you find more and more niche markets are out there who want to know that it is handmade, it is hand done by someone. When people know who made, made a piece, it is less disposable. When you go into a large store and you buy something that you, you, you see hundreds there's less value to it. And, and, and you find nowadays persons, they don't even know how to sew a button. So if something is damaged, they throw it away. If you know who made, made, made something that is handmade and you know the time and effort that went into it and the love that went into it, you're not gonna dispose of that so easily. You're gonna try and have it mended by that person or somebody who understands the craft. And I think that's what we're going back to because people are becoming more and more attached to their clothing in terms of not wanting it to just be disposable because of fast fashion. And in terms of tapping into, you know, the new business and using up our old skills, it will go back to really focusing on high quality clothing, focusing on, on sustainability and not just, not just fast fashion, focusing on local sourcing, artisanal um, craft and just, making people more attached to their clothing. You're selling an experience, you're selling a product that you want people to hold on to because the landfills really and truly can't, can't, you know, can't sustain all the waste that we are, we're, we're creating from fashion. We, it, it's a trillion dollar industry, as you said before, but we are also one of the largest um, creators of waste. And it is, it, is, it is unbelievable. And we all have to play our part. And I think sustainable fashion is our answer and and it's it's such it's such a multifaceted um issue right now because it's 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 about circular fashion it's about end-to-end -end, um end-to-end -end fashion understanding the material how what, what materials you're using and for us in terms of reigniting old talents we're gonna have to go back to weaving our own fabrics whether it's from him or you know using biodegradable fabrics because majority of the fabrics that we get in Jamaica now or in the in the region is polyester and that is not good for the environment unless we're going to be recycling over and over and you find for most designers who try to upcycle and recycle it is very difficult because most clothing these days come with buttons and zippers and all these hardware that's hard to remove for you to have a, a, an, an easy task of upcycling and we're going to have to really assess you know, refashioning, upcycling, and see how best we can do that because that is actually the way of the future. We can't just keep discarding. We have to, we have to use the waste. We have to find a way to use the waste for, you know, future business. And I'm going to leave it there for now because I could talk for hours on this topic and I just want, you know, others to chime in. And 
if there are questions, definitely I'll be able to answer. Well, two critical points I hear coming out um, between yourself and Robert Kenya. And I'm really glad that you have injected the whole matter of sustainable business practices, sustainable production and sustainability as a positioning strategy and coupling that with ancient skills, with modern techniques, and as Robert's saying now, leveraging on the strength of the culture and the, the, the kind of um, trends in the global market space. So I'm hearing this, this conversation coming into play now with how are we positioning ourselves in that global space if we are going to be competitive, if we are going to have some kind of unique offer to the space. We need to be looking at these matters of sustainability and that's a global discussion jamaica is perfectly poised as well because that discussion is important for our ecosystem our own um fragility is in, is is factored in here so it would be a good positioning strategy so as we get into the discussion some more i want to really hear from you kenya you know how do you go about that what are some of the things that they need to be thinking about now in their production processes and their designs and so on. So we will now move on to Laurelie Jones, who will be talking to us about the next generation and the future of fashion. And Laura, we are hearing using um, old skills and you know how are we going to be merging that with new trends? And let me just introduce Laura to the guest. Laura has spent over some 20 plus years working extensively in the creative industries, providing design, business development support, and mentorship in and with agencies such as JAMPRO, JBDC, the International Trade Center, as well as private entities as a consultant. Laura has also focused on world heritage, and I would love to hear how some of that, the culture and all of that comes into play, and intangible cultural heritage through work done with the UNESCO. Laura is passionate for the creative industries. It motivates her to synergize her expertise in order to create solutions, and solutions are definitely some things we want to hear in this discussion that can drive sustainable development. So, Laura, tell us now the future of the fashion industry and the next generation. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Janine, Ms. V. Well, I want to say, uh, can you hear me well? I'm in a room that has a, it's a, a big room with a lot of echo. You hearing me? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Awesome. You know, Robert and Mrs. George have started the conversation, and I guess other panelists will start that conversation around sustainability. So when we're looking at the next generation of fashion pra practitioners, as I call them, we cannot have that con conversation without talking about sustainability. And I'm glad that those were the first points that were raised. As a matter of fact, that's the first point I have on my, my list here. Um, there can be no conversation around the, the future of fashion without the talk about sustainability, right? And as Robert and Kenya has put it so aptly, you know, um, I really don't need to expound on that. Uh, more than to add something that I pulled from the Harvard Business Review um, in 2021. Uh, where they're saying that an active consciousness about reducing environmental footprint, trimming operational waste, and using resources more is going to be one of the focus or central focus for any business, and in particular, any kind of um, venture into fashion. Right, so for the next generation of fashion practitioners, I'm going to be using that word, um, that has to be you know, set front and center in the mindset. If they're not going to enter the field with that kind of thinking, 
then we're going to have they're going to have some challenges. And Mrs. George spoke to just the impact that the fashion industry has on the environment globally. And it becomes a, a major concern for consumers as well. So we can't ignore it anymore. Um, Robert spoke about some of the trends that are taking place as it relates to upcycling, repurposing. Um, once upon a time in Jamaica, we wouldn't wear what we call, you know, old clothes, people clothes. Now it's quite fashionable to thrift. We call it thrifting, right? So those are some global trends that are not going to be, you know, they're not going to take a back seat anytime soon. And so as a fashion designer emerging, um, those are some things to think about. Um, this is George also spoke about going back to some of the traditional ways of doing things because, of course, um, those kinds of techniques were from long time were very conscious about um, reducing waste, uh, using less. And so one of the points I have here is that of working as an atelier, right? where you focus on customization, you focus on specialization, you focus on mastery, right? And in particular areas. And surely when we think about our crochet, when we think about weaving, you know, whether it's straw or otherwise, when we think about cutwork embroidery, um, some people in the audience might be wondering what I'm talking about. But these were techniques that we, you know, the, they were the thing back in the day. You know, Elaine Elegance, who still operates out from Devon House, was one of our, um, is one of our individuals who was very good in cutwork embroidery. There were places like uh, Sassy's that cutwork embroidery was 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 so fashionable. Now these are some of the techniques that definitely will give us, you know, an edge here in not just Jamaica, but the Caribbean, right? Because these are techniques that we are used to seeing. Some of our youngsters will say, oh, my granny used to wear that, but I'm telling you, those are the kinds of um, things, techniques that are creating, you know, the custom products that are have high value because it's done by hand. Um, Mrs. George spoke about, the, the buyer, the, the customer wanting to know how the things are made. They want to hear those stories. And so we have the opportunity right here, right now to revive some of those techniques that will add value, but also define the, the brand or the, you know, the business that you're trying to fashion. Um, I also have on my list a point about collaboration. <laughs> I know for some people, you know, some designers, some youngsters, collaboration is not necessarily the first word that comes to mind. But surely COVID has taught us that, you know, we can't, we can't go it alone. And so collaboration is not only to work for someone else, but also to help you to understand the business, to learn, to learn from people who are in the industry. And I would say for those um, who are looking towards fashion as you know, the, the, the way they want to go, you have to also think about collaborating because no one is an island, right? No man is an island. And there's so much to learn when you collaborate. I also want to talk about, uh, Robert spoke about technology. No, why? <laughs> there's nothing that we do now that doesn't have some element of technology that's driving it, right? And so for the future generation in fashion, it's even going to get, technology is going, is going to get even more integrated into what we know as fashion, right? And so COVID again has shown us how the use of technology has transformed even how consumers behave now. There are these fashion apps Robert wasn't talking about some of these things, you know, these fashion apps um, that, you know, made to measure um, their, you know, if we talk about um, how we're shopping online, there's Amazon, there's Sheen, there's Etsy, there's Shopify, all of these um, technology driven um, platforms are changing the habits of our consumers and we have to cue into that. And so any student who is coming in to do a fashion program, 
has to understand that, has to understand that it's not just pure passion and creativity anymore that is going to define them or set them apart, but they have to know, integrate how the technology will help them to build their brands. We have to understand who is the, who is that customer that we're going after, right? Who is the fashion customer today? What are they buying? Where are they buying? We have to understand that. And that is something that, um, again, we can't take it for granted anymore that no man wants to build, you know, build a house and they will come. But how will they know about us? How are we creating something that they want? Do they want it? Where do they want to go and get this? These are some of the things. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking a bit now about a business model, but I will expound on that a little later. Um, just want to share some stats with you. This is coming from Euro, uh, Euro Monitor International, sorry. It said in 2021, 30% of global apparel and footwear sales were via e-commerce as compared to 19% in 2019. And of course, we know we were all apart. We, well, I guess we were all stuck at home, some of us, I guess, during the pandemic. And we saw how e-commerce really transformed how we could do things. We're on a lockdown, but it didn't stop us from getting some things. We went online and we were shopping online and doing all kinds of things online. And that trend, is only going to grow, right? This is the new norm. I don't like using that word, but the new norm is going to be driven a lot by technology and a lot of interface online. Um, as we talk about online, Robert mentioned it somewhat. How is this going to now drive how we reimagine retail spaces? Right? So retail spaces are not only just the physical spaces, the stores that we like to walk into. I personally still like to walk into a store and, you know, pick up things and try things on. But surely e-commerce is changing that kind of interaction. So when we think of retail, think of not just the brick and mortar, but we're also thinking of the online world. And again, for any individual who is looking at fashion as their um, for their future plans, you have to be thinking in that kind of dual way, right? We have seen in Jamaica, for example, a lot of pop-up stores, a lot more pop-up stores. We have seen contraction. We've seen individuals who have closed their physical stores and have now moved to an online platform. So that is something that definitely has to be taken in consideration when you're thinking about fashion. Um, I also have on my list here, you know, this whole thing about supply chain reboot. And um, I think it was Robert who mentioned about China, right? So there is, and, you know, there's just a kind of a, there's a shift somewhat. So we used to rely so much on these things coming from China, but we've had a pandemic. Now we have a Ukraine um, crisis. We have increased prices in shipping and material and all of those things happening. So we've seen a kind of a, a rebooting of the supply chain. We can't rely solely on these external places anymore. What we're also seeing is a move to where things, we're looking closer to home to sourcing things. And that's good, right? Because what it also means, Ms. B mentioned opportunities. That provides an opportunity for us to do business with possibly our regional partners and do business closer to home, right? Um, I remember one designer telling me a couple months ago that there has been some amount of interest locally, more interest from local hoteliers to buying products from, from him because they no longer can get the, you know, the, the um, imported stuff as easily. And so that is good for local business, for regional business as well. Um, I want to put a plug here because I, you know, I'm an educator that our designers locally also need to take the opportunity and work with local designers, fashion designers, textile designers, because we do have them. We do have a lot of graduates 
from the, the Edna Manley College. We also have graduates from UTEC because UTEC has their, their fashion program as well. And so we need to utilize them. We need to utilize these designers, these textile artists to come up with new collections, new prints, new, you know, woven fabrics, you name it. We need to utilize them more, right? We don't always have to look outside. We have them right here in Jamaica, in the region by extension. Um, yeah, one other thing I want to put in here before I close. There is this new world of NFTs. No, I don't understand it. Do not ask me to explain it. I am still learning. But it is definitely driving the way, it's transforming the way we're doing business. It's transforming the way we design. It's transforming the way um, that we just, just like exist. As I said, I'm just still trying to, to understand it, right? And it's this, for those who don't know what NFTs are, I'm sure y'all do. Non-fungal tokens. I hope I got that pronunciation right, Robert. Now, this is, this is in a virtual space and it is definitely um, seeped into the fashion space as well. There are things like, you know, virtual garments and fashion NFTs that are growing, right? More and more um, brands, bigger brands are buying into this. Um, Nike has its own thing. Several um, big brands that we know have bought into this NFT world. And definitely for any practitioner, any aspiring designer, um, the future lies where that is as well, the, the possibility of, I am still used to doing things in a very tangible way. I want to go to the store and I want to buy something. In the metaverse world, there's this thing that exists in virtual reality, if you want to call it that. It, it exists and it doesn't exist, but it is definitely driving the way how businesses are you know, doing what they do. It's also an opportunity for designers to get, you know, have a broader reach. Um, and I, I think I'm going to close here because I know Robert will talk some more about this and some of the other panelists will talk some more about this, but that's where I'll, I'll leave it for now. Thanks, Laura. And right away, I am hearing coming, coming from all three panelists, certainly some need now to look at the curriculum and adjusting mm. the way the students are learning and, and, and embedding other skills around the design skills, you know, not just emphasizing the design skills. And I'm hearing you talking about business models and how to apply the concepts so that they can successfully engage in commerce. And so thanks, Laura, for that. That is um, definitely a key point as we go into this discussion and we start looking at, you know, how persons are engaging with the marketplace. Um, the chat is blowing up. I'm seeing the comments. As soon as we hear from Miriam, we will inject some of the points that I see coming up um, in the chat because there are some important points that we really need to get through. So let me go ahead now and just jump into discussion with Miriam. Hi, Smith. Miriam is currently the Dean at the Entermanley School of Visual and Performing Arts at the Entermanley College. And Miriam will be talking to us about how can the fashion industry survive this cheap import mass labeling. And I hear the term fast fashion and in the chat I say fast price. <laughs> how is the industry going to um, survive all these new dynamics in the in the marketplace. Before we jump into that, let me just give a brief introduction. Miriam has had several years of experience and training in the textile um, textile design for fashion, and also as an educator at Edna Manley College. And she has exhibited at several galleries and trade shows and exhibitions and so on, and certainly would have a wealth of knowledge as to what is happening on the ground in that market space and what 
is the sort of kind of innovation that needs to take place to keep us current. And so I would love to just jump right into the discussion with you, Miriam, take, take over and lead us into this survival strategy now. Hi, good morning. Um, are you hearing me clearly? Very clear, yes. All right, thank you for this opportunity to be in a conversation with my colleagues and uh, practitioners within the uh, fashion industry locally. No, I, I, I come to this um, from having my foot firmly planted in two spaces, from um, working as a creative, and working as someone whose underpinning is in fashion and the substance we tend to use, the textiles, yeah, the core of it. Now, we need to understand that when we say fashion, we're talking about a massive umbrella that takes in clothing, footwear, accessories, yeah? But for me, I wanna, I wanna put it like this. Now, we understand that consumers generally consider the global fashion industry to be the retail sale of apparel around the world. Now, we really need to recognize that this, the business of this industry is, is so much broader. And I was happy to hear my colleagues, Ms. Jones, I was happy to hear Mr. Hall undergird these components by speaking about aspects that needs to be at the forefront in terms of us envisioning how we're gonna go forward with fashion. Now I've been given task with a particular component as it provides the, the, the opportunity. Can we survive mass imports, mass labeling? And all of what Mr. Mr. Hall particularly spoke about in terms of access via the internet, things being online, things are at everybody's fingertips. Even in my own household, you can, I've seen where my daughter, she's very much into shopping online. I don't think she has ever put set foot in a store to buy anything for herself locally. And um, one of the things that that says to me is how are we then positioning ourselves locally to be accessible in that frame? And how are we looking at understanding our consumers to also provide them with the kind of access to what we produce to then create another conversation as it speaks to those who are able to go online and access those mass produced garments that are then you know labeled and brought in as a local creation so what it actually says to me is that within that nexus it is telling us that there is an opportunity that we need to capitalize on, that we need to make a part of our landscape in terms of how we position ourselves. So it's about position and accessibility, because if you look at it now, and we talk to our Gen Zs, yeah, we are baby boomers, Laura, Mr. Jones, myself, we are from the baby boomers um, landscape, and there have been three other generations in between that understanding how they access and what they're looking for and how uh, they respond to trends really can give us a foot in with a lot of what has been said. Now, I had prepared to talk about this from the angle of sustainability, collaboration, yeah? Um, recognizing opportunities within those spaces. And so the short answer to the question of um, the, can the fashion industry survive cheap imports and mass labeling? My short answer there is yes, but it's going to take us getting a few things in order or becoming more au fait and inclusive in using a few more things, technology in terms of accessibility. Yeah, how do we identify and brand ourselves? How do we um, and coming from a space of education, we're getting the young ones in the Gen Z's, et cetera. What are they looking for to take them forward as fashion designers? What is it that they will be telling us in terms of their needs to take them into these market spaces to provide what we have as a very culturally rich space? For me, I'm coming from a space of looking at indigenous textiles 
I'm into the natural dyeing. I'm into the use of local fiber. Right now, I'm actually in a project collabing with uh, an entity that is growing uh, marijuana hemp for medicinal purposes. But then there's a byproduct from that. What can we do with this? How can this impact what we have to offer? So it also provides an opportunity for research. It provides an opportunity wherein we can do inter um, collaborative um, engagement with uh, other entities within the space, uh, Edna U Tech collaboration, why not? Uh, so as it pertains to where we go and what we use, we have right now, we're looking even at what we have had historically. We've had so many stellar um, designers that were specific in particular spaces. You had like a Frances Keene with her beautiful cutwork, um, you know, her, her kind of approach to, to fashion. Why are we not then looking at how we can nurture um, retaining some of what I call these cultural um, significant um, icons in our fashion industry that they have given us the seed and the, the space with which to pull from, reimagine and re-engage with our public. Yeah, because right now, if you're looking even at the World Games, yes, I think it was Robert that mentioned it, or uh, Miss George, our ladies were out there blazing in all their glory, but doing it in style and fashion, as we would say. And these are things that we need to look at how we can maximize. So whatever we're, we're, we as Jamaicans, we know how to push through and COVID did lock us down. It stopped us in our tracks, yes. And those who were ahead of us in terms of being online and having everything at the fingertip of their consumers, this is now saying to us, that is what we need to maximize on. Those are things we need to make as a part of our arsenal in terms of bringing back a balance to what this mass labeling um, approach to importation. Yeah, because we're not going to, let's, let's be real, we're not going to get away from that, but we can innovate and be ahead in terms of what we can provide locally and then internationally, because of course, once we're able to provide it for our consumers, most certainly um, we will then, then be able to get another level of traction from our, the international spaces. Now, when I talk about collaboration, for me, it's collaboration between designers, fashion designers, textile designers, and our local um, plethora of Jamaican icons, yeah? I mean, and I will say nothing suits my heart than seeing a Dr. Vereen Shepherd in one of my designs, yeah? And that came out of a collaborative um, engagement with a, a, a label, Comet Revisited. Yeah, so what I'm saying is that there is still that room and the, 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 the opportunity and possibility exists where we collab through education, through recognizing what we have as a gold mine historically. As um, Ms. Linton George says, the fashion cycle is, is, it's, it's, it, it, it is continually turning, but it's turning even faster. So we need to be able to inject at, at very key points uh, ideas that we recognize as being Jamaican, as being rich in, in our culture, rich in our tradition, yeah? And teaming, collaborating with individuals that we know are the faces and names and brands of what is Jamaica. So, for me, th this is a space of opportunity. It really isn't something that scares me. It really is something that we can embrace. One of the things that I, however, would like to speak to is the, the social justice component as it pertains to recognizing certain brands that actually, um, hmm, how oh, should I put this now? Uh, undermine human rights in terms of garment production and what is provided. So 
I think there needs to be that conversation as well to sensitize individuals in understanding how to navigate that space, even if it is that they want to stay in a space that brings in cheap import, etc. But also not to forget the fact that there is a human rights element in terms of how a lot of these garments are mass produced. Yeah. So that care, I believe, is also something that we need to balance and bring into the balance in terms of the education that goes out there for individuals that would want to take this route of mass labeling. So it is something that is curricular as well, something that can be infused in our curriculum, most certainly. But I still believe that above all else, we have the where it all to still maintain niche market provision within the fashion and apparel um, industry locally. I don't think we have to fear. I think we have to be forceful and be strident in terms of setting agendas to meet our landscape. Because right now, when you talk about climate change is real, sustainability and landfill, I hear um, George mentioned it, and I, it was something that it is very close and near and dear to my heart, the fact that we, we need to be looking at ways of creating more sustainable or carbon footprint globally uh, is heavy in the fashion industry. The fashion industry carbon footprint, particularly when it comes to manufacturing, when you're looking at all those petroleum based um, synthetics that are manufactured, yes, leaves a very heavy carbon footprint. And within our island space as an island nation, these are things we need to embrace and recognize that there's a lot more we can do with what actually comes in before it actually reaches, reaches a landfill. And for me, through education, that's where it sits. This is a space, the Edna Manley College, where we bring the art and design into conversation, provides, I believe, a good platform to responding to a lot of these concerns as they, 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 they are raised. I see you're back in frame. I get the yes. feeling that it's a time thing. <laughs> no, it's just that I am listening and I have so many questions. And um, before I get into the discussion aspect, I want to just remind our participants that they can certainly include their voice in the discussion, raise your hands if you want to ask a question or you want to put a, a comment in the chat. And I think there is a link as well that you can use to put your questions. But Miriam, um, you said something that I want to couple with something that Laura spoke about, and it's on the matter of collaboration. And I noticed that when you were speaking about collaboration, you mentioned about the designers collaborating with icons. And when I think about some of the points Laura raised about the, the other business aspects around that, the technology, the use of new um, design um, tools and things of that nature. How, how do you see that collaboration extending to other aspects, not just from the, the, the design component? And any other, other panelists can, can chime in as well if they have a response. But Miriam, let me start with you. When you speak about collaboration, because we want to get to this place mm -hmm. where we're seeing real um, strategies that they can use right. to move in. Right. So, so let's take, um, let's take a, um, let me move away from, from garments, for example. In Jamaica, one of the things I grew up seeing a lot of was, um, you know, those shoemakers, those Jamaican shoemakers that really know how to cut and create a pair of shoes. We have those guys here, you know, you know that, right? But let's say now we have a, an end of manly student, for argument's sake, who's drawing a two-dimensional reference of a, a shoe. Why can't we then say have a collaboration between that person who understands the dynamics of the making with that person who understands the dynamics of the creation in terms of the aesthetics? Yeah. Um, years ago, when I did my studies, um, my master's, I had the had the opportunity of being the one of the first designers to exhibit at the IPMA in, um, in, 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 in Milan with fabric that was designed digitally, printed digitally, and cut digitally. Yeah? My, my, and that was, I will tell you how long ago that would, that would date me. 
because what I wanted to see Jamaica embrace was technology in a way that sustains our environment in terms of the effluence that comes with the, the, the regular approach to textiles and fiber and, and fabric design, but to also catapult us in terms of the use of technology. Right now, um, if you look at any graduate coming out of a Chelsea or, or a Winchester, they are working with this technology now, and they're also embracing what is called adaptable fashion. So even the cut and make of garments now are not even so size prescribed, but created in ways that I can pull a strap here, put a tie there, and the look of it is even so I would say, I would want to say futuristic, but yes, that is the word that comes to mind that says I'm stepping away from, you know, utilizing the regular bespoke approach to making, but then I'm giving it more applicability and pliability and wearability to a wider cross section. Mr. Hall spoke about gender fluidity in fashion, and this is where it is going. So even in the construction, where we have the traditional pattern where, you know, it's a hip, the way things are shifting so that you can actually create fashion that you can play around with and redesign, recreate using this one construct. So you are actually giving this fashion piece that is created a longer life and a longer look. So even if I wear it two, three, four times, I'm not looking the same each time I wear it. So that kind of innovation in terms of how you perceive fashion or you construct fashion, that also adds to that, that requires a level of collaboration in terms of how that approach is taken. And Moses, I see your hand. I'm just gonna jump back to some major points that the panelists raised, and then I will um, give you access to access. And, and I just want to add one of the things that I, I recognize too, and I, I, I was really gobsmacked by it. Studying in a space, I studied in England. One of the things that I recognized too was the interest of industry in student ideas, um, student ideation in, in fashion and design. So I had the opportunity of meeting Adana Karan. Uh, other students met um, representative of, of Amiyaki because they're coming. What are these young people thinking of? How are they using what is coming out of industry and even non-traditional industrial applications to fashion? They want to see how are students innovating. And for me, I want to see here that kind of collaboration between industry and our educational institution to invest in providing an opportunity for students to experiment, yeah, and to create and to co-create in terms of what we're considering to, to take forward as fashion, understanding the need for sustainability and the impact of, of our carbon footprint or the need to reduce same in our own space. Thanks, Miriam. Now, um, Robert, in your presentation, you introduced another side of the technology that is not dealing so much with the consumer side, but certainly on the design side. So we're seeing that we are looking at online and how that is impacting, but we are, what I'm hearing from you is that the digital transformation is also transforming the way we move the product from the design, the concept, and I know Laura mentioned virtual reality as well. Take us a little bit through that to help us to understand how we capitalize on, on accessing those te techniques. Thanks. Um, and I, I just must, you know, like to all my co-presenters, I mean, you know, it's really great to just really have this discussion from different, you know, persons from different polarities. Um, as we talk about, you know, the digital as you not know, a tool of transmission. I remember when I was in school and that was also when Laura was in school, LOL, um, that, you know, we were there kind of dreaming about, oh my God, what's happening in New York, what's happening in Milan, what's happening, whatever. And oh, if somebody could see the great design that I did today in my textile class, whatever, whatever, right? No, you know, we, because of social media, um, 
social media literally becomes you now the space you now where a lot of these borders have been taken down. And so what were what 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 had to be you now a trade show representation, you have to pay a whole bag of money to these big spaces. No, literally can't just be scrolling. I mean, the fact that even with we, we you know we, we mentioned very briefly the issue of modeling, the fact that nowadays with modeling and scouting, a lot of scouting is done online. You, you have the issue of the um I don't remember the, the current name, but literally like they just go online and just scout some people and just pull them. And so you almost have no, even the mother industry changing because of that. So we have to understand. So even while we speak about these things of digital and you know, NFTs, et cetera, which of course we know are the larger, more established spaces within, within, which, this, which, within which this is happening, traditionally, and it's still happening today, our culture has a way of turning your hand make fashion, finding the roads and finding the cracks to basically break ourselves into, the, into, into these spaces. The fact that our athletes, we know, train on grass when usually you're supposed to be training on you know, track, whatever, with X turf and all that kind of thing. Um, so what I'm now saying is that we have to now understand that as we have started that innovation on digital, where we're now, where basically we have this method locally, and I know I've, I've heard of it mentioned in some other places as well, to so where we literally use Instagram. So people just go on and make free of X item. Oh, I have this swimsuit, that, 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 you know, DM, DM me for prices, you know, and literally you see people starting transaction that, that way and actually ending and literally that is literally a a clear channel for them to actually bring the product to the fore. What I'm now saying is that we now need to take this seriously and begin to also merge it with the other ways that we do business like bespoke. Internationally, when it comes to bespoke um, and custom, that is something that's happening in the couture level as in the highest level and the most expensive level. We are very used to walking to adjustment and say, look here, fix this, I don't like it. You know, um, take this dress that I got here and change up that da -da -da, and I come with a new idea. Can we bring that now to an international space where it moves just beyond who I can physically contact and have contact with in Jamaica to a global phenomenon as in, uh, can this be a global way that we do business? We, we have to understand that the business model is very important to translate the value from just the concept of, oh, we are Jamaicans and we're on the track and yeah, them always look hype to, Yes, we are Jamaicans. Let me do some business with them so that basically some money can actually come here. So what I'm saying though is that can we, and that's why I mentioned Stitch Fix, because with Stitch Fix and you have some of these other methods where they have found a way to where literally they, they have you, what is it now? They have, they have a way that they can actually get your measurements. And so regardless of what size, you don't have to just be a supermodel size with predictable body, you know, that. But you can be any size. And of course, you know, once, you know, when life starts happening and you put on weight in all kinds of ways, then of course, you no, know, you want to you know, ensure that you have stuff that fits. And literally, these are business models where, that are working where literally you have a stylist that sends you stuff every two weeks or every month or whatever. And you literally take the stuff that you want from it, you pay for it, and you send back the box. Can we use that even as a hybrid, you know, to even basically evolve this hybrid business methodology that we can literally allow this creative value to convert something you know, that really begins to feed into this economy. Hearing from you, Robert, is that we need to expand our borders even on, on the collaboration end, not just in terms of, you know, expand it outside of Jamaica and fuse some of those things together to come up with value creation. Right, I get that. And that leads me to know something you said, Kenya, about looking at traditional techniques such as weaving, getting our own fabric. I heard Miriam mentioning the, the or, or was it Laura, um, the impact of the supply chain and how that would now open up opportunities for us to revisit looking at creating our own raw materials and using traditional techniques as a as a social media scanner, I would have seen that quite a number of persons have been adopting this crocheted, um, you know, vest looking things that we would never be caught. Yeah, Dead yeah. in the best one, the dance style, gang style, whatever, it's now being repurposed into fashion, high end fashion, and the influencers dressing in that. I, I see that as addressing the point you raised on looking at traditional techniques and merging it with. Tell us a little bit more on how you, what are some of the ideas that come up for you when you say, looking at those traditional techniques, merging it with, with modern trends, and how would, as, for example, a JBBC go about activating that, making it a reality? 
So what do you find? So, so recently I did a collection for um, Rwanda Fashion Week and I collaborated with Blessing Beads, story and myth Blessing Beads. And I used her beads to do beading on the yoke and neckline and bodies of several pieces that I presented for Fashion Week. And it was absolutely beautiful. It was well received. No, as a designer, I don't, I don't have that team to go out and source beading. And she had to have them dyed and have the holes done particular ways and everything. And I don't have the team for that. So collaboration will come in quite handy when you're taking on um, accents that you, 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 you don't have the skill set to create or produce yourselves. And it creates an opportunity for that designer as well. And you're both benefiting because you're purchasing these beads or whatever it is you're purchasing from this designer you're collaborating with. And so there are other designers who I've collaborated with and continue to, like we collaborated with Beanie Bud straw bags recently. And we're doing another collaboration, which is going to be absolutely beautiful. It's not out yet, but we, I, I find collaboration is the way to utilize a lot of the artisanal work that we have in the industry in Jamaica. And what you find is, and what I've been hearing weaving through a lot of the conversation is, we are going back to the old ways and we are going back to the traditional, you know, dressmaker type mentality, as you would call it, where it is bespoke, it is high end, and we don't realize how high end it is. Everybody wants to say, oh, I bought this online, I bought this at Gucci, or I bought this here and there, or I bought this at Macy's. But to be honest, I'm, I'm in the UK at the moment. And to say that you have something made, custom made, bespoke for you, is an absolute luxury and we take it for granted in Jamaica and I struggled for years and even mailing in Trinidad told me about it where she said you know we're in this rush to sell online and to sell off the rack and if you're not selling off the rack and have an inventory of you know dozens of clothing you don't feel like you're succeeding in the industry and she said she found that 90% of her sales were actually custom made designs. And I said to her the same, I'm having the same problem. And I literally started to turn back my custom made customers saying, oh no, we're not doing any custom made at this moment. We're only selling off the rack because I was falling into the trap of the industry that was dictating to us that you have to manufacture in sizes and have them hanging for people to come and file through and decide if they wanted to buy. And it didn't work. And I even went as far during COVID because we, we, we never ever had enough stock in the boutique because we were always trapped doing custom wear because that's, what the, that's, the, that's where the demand was. And we, were, we weren't really following you know, the, 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 the consumer. We were listening to the global market saying, you, know, you have to have stock, you have to have inventory, you have to be online and you have to have the sizes and so forth. So during COVID, when clothes stopped selling, I decided to keep my staff on and use savings to pay them in order to use that downtime to create inventory. So we have this whole heap of clothes now, and guess what? It's sitting there because people still want custom. You tell them you have this in every size and they, oh, I don't want that one, I want it in pink instead. Jamaican people, they want it to be unique. Is there something in our blood, it's in our vein, it's in the trini, it, is a Caribbean thing. I don't know what it is, but they, they want bespoke. And I have decided from an experience I had in 2015, where I went to Thailand and I went to a store because whenever I travel, no matter where in the world, I want to buy something that is made in that country. And I said, I have to get something made of silk because Thailand is a place for silk. I was buying silk to bring home, but I also wanted something made there of silk. And I went to a, 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 a designer and I said, you know, I want something, everything they had, you couldn't just buy it and leave at, at the time. They had everything on display and you, or they had catalogs. You had to order it and you get it within 24 hours. And I couldn't understand, oh, how, are you, how are you gonna do this? But I had actually done it before in Jamaica where I have customers who will come in and say, I need something, I have an event tomorrow. And we just kind of, you know, pull together with the team and we get it done. And when the person said to me, we have a business model where we have 350 seamstresses in a factory. And when you place your order, 
the fabric is already there. The pattern is already there. All the graded sizes are already there. When you place your order, we take your measurements, we adjust it and grade it to your measurements and we start the production immediately because the seamstresses are there waiting for your order rather than us having an inventory of clothing made waiting for you that we're going to end up have to send to a discount store that's going to end up in a landfill somewhere because nobody's buying it you can't predict what people are going to want so now we have started where we we make a sample or if, if we know it's going to be a good seller we might make four sizes and we have that and we we, we let the customers dictate what we should make for the coming week and when you order it online it is being made within two days it's made and it's being shipped. So it's shipped within three days and it works better for us because we don't have this inventory sitting there and in every minute, because right now I have dresses that I keep reposting on social media and I get tired of seeing it myself. Well, guess what? It needs to sell. So I'm going to keep reposting it because I fell into the trap of this system that said to me that I needed inventory. So therefore you're going to have to see that dress with a different handbag today on a different person because that dress need to sell because I invested the money in manufacturing that dress because you told me I needed to have it on a rack available in sizes and we did it. It doesn't work. And the new model right now is we have to have a demand driven model rather than an inventory model because the inventory model, as you can see, is not working across the world. Look at all these discount stores. I, I, I went to a mall I, I was passing a mall in Lewisham in London and I saw a sign that said they had dresses and beautiful dresses, one pound. They said everything in the store today is one pound. Now, who did you pay to sew that? Where did you get the fabric from? It is actually just waste. They're just trying to dump clothing on people. And then people know because you pay one pound for it, it means nothing to you. Where at one time you post on Instagram, you want to discard it because it is a dollar. It is a pound. It means nothing to you. I know you can't get fabric for one pound. I know I can't pay anybody one pound to, to, to cut, stitch, press, or do anything to a garment. It is unbelievable. The, the, the market that we're in and the system that we're in of consumption and waste and, and we perpetuate it and the customers perpetuate it, the policymakers perpetuate it and it's just a never ending cycle. And until we, the designers decide, listen, I need to change my model, it's gonna continue. And I decided I'm changing my model. I've stopped doing stock only for like, I, I, I do limited, limited stock. Gone are the days when I was doing dozens of one dress if I do three, you're lucky. And the demand, the fabric is there, the pattern is there. Once you order it, it's ready in two days and shipped by the third day. You, you're still gonna get it. And if you want it overnight, we can do it. Cause we've done it before. I remember when Yendi was going to the Grammys and she wanted a dress last minute. We pulled together and we got that dress done last minute for her. So we, we can do it. And they, the, the people are there waiting for the, for, for, for the work. And you know, what, what I'm seeing now is we are, looking to the rest of the world for the model that they have taken on. And they're actually looking to us and we don't even realize. Right now I'm, I'm talking with a, with a company in the UK who's doing a, I found out they're doing a training program in Jamaica to train seamstresses in Jamaica because they want to tap into that model of saying, these clothes are made in a small country by a small group of women and the story behind the garment, they have tapped into how important that is and we're trying to, get investors to help us to manufacture in China, which is what they're shifting away from. And we don't even realize we're running towards the, 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 the disaster that they're, they're running from. Um, and we're, we, we've bought into it. And until we realize that the model we have is precious and we are onto something and we need to just hold on to the tradition that we have. It, it, when I was going to fashion school at, at, at um, the University at, at Central St. Martin, in London, I remember a lot of my tutors saying to me, Jamaica has the best seamstresses in the world. And it was so heartwarming to hear that. I heard it from three different persons and I said, wow, not anymore because all of them migrate and you know, <laughs> half of them in Cayman, half of them, you know, all over the world because they have been taken from us. 
and there's been no mass mass training program for our, our seamstresses anymore. And the craft has really, it, it's very difficult to find a seamstress these days in Jamaica. And uh, we try to do training programs. And then you now foreign companies are training people in Jamaica to use them overseas because they know that we have a skill and a talent that is beyond, you see it in our athletes, you see it in our musicians, we have a skill and a talent that is world renowned. And we need to tap into that and respect and appreciate it, nurture it, groom it, and just utilize it because there is so much potential in the industry. There is absolutely so much. You know what? I've forgotten the question that you asked me. I hope I answered it. <laughs> you, answered it you answered it and more. And of course, we got the quote of the day from what all of what you just said. Um, we are running to the disaster. They are running from. <laughs> so we need to own our thing laura see your hand and i want you to chime in and I also i'm not sure what you are going to ask but my question to you laura is given what we are saying is the strategy positioning sustainability we spoke and 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 unearthing our traditional techniques and merging in with new technology for for output and demand driven and all those beautiful things what do you say now to the generation that is coming in that says they want to, to study this, um, this industry? What are some of the things you think needs to be adjusted in the curriculum to support them coming out and, and, and addressing and meeting all these recommendations that are being tabled? And we heard, of course, that as part of the long-term sustainability plan, education is one of the key pillars. So, Chime in, Laura, let me hear what you are saying. Laura? Are you hearing me? Yes, hearing you now. Awesome. That's a loaded question. But I want to just, before I answer the question, I just want to, to big up Miss George and Mrs. George and what she just said. And I wrote it before she said this, you know. Caribbean has always had a unique way and model in how it approached fashion. And Robert, you and I have had this discussion. It has always had a unique way. Um, and, and, and part of this unique way of doing business, there was a certain amount of consistency and standard. There was a certain nostalgia. So the nostalgia comes from, give it to me in pink, black, blue, white, the same style, because I like it so much. It was so well done. Yeah, and there was always, I see uh, Moses um, putting it in the, in the chat, that on demand. Robert, you and I have had this conversation about, when we talk about the dressmakers, I remember when I was graduating from high school, back whenever, right? I went, to, I drew the style of my dress. I went to, I think it was Premier Plaza and I bought the fabric and I took it to my dressmaker and she made my graduation dress. And, for, and that was the, the year of 1988, right? And most of us, if not all of us graduating that year, we went to a dressmaker or we made it ourselves because there were several of us who loved sewing. So we've always had a unique model in the Caribbean. It's unfortunate that, I guess we'd say at the end of the 80s, our model for um, industrial development in Jamaica shifted somewhat. And so we took on what the old, the, you know, the bigger players in industry were saying from outside. And it, and it really, you know, uprooted some of the strides that we made in our industry and in the fashion industry within Jamaica. That's unfortunate. And it's interesting to know that we're kind of, it's like a 360 and they're looking in on us again to look at how we have, because we have survived a lot of turmoil, you know, and I must say, I have to say, I have to put this plug. Whilst there has been a contraction through because of COVID, there are a lot, well, let me not say a lot, let me not generalize. There are some companies that have been able to grow through COVID. Some of our local companies have been able to grow through COVID and have expanded. And we're in expansion mode even before COVID. So that, that in and of itself, um, you know, we must take some props that, you know, 
even though some people say we don't have an industry and it's a sector, it doesn't matter how we, we, we frame it. There are some things that some people are doing right. Now we want more people to be doing it right and getting it right. Now, Janine, I totally forget the question, but I'm going to try and answer. Education, First, what we should education. So our model for, for me, and I mean, my boss is online, but <laughs> our model for education has to change, has to shift. No longer are we um, engaging students because they're, go, they're going to go into a job, lock, stock, stock and barrel. We have to shift our education model to, to one where we're encouraging innovators, we're encouraging entrepreneurs, we're encouraging inventors, creating these individuals. You're not leaving college, or high school anymore to go get our work. We have to shift where they're now creating the opportunities. They're creating, they're inventing because we have to move from being just a society where we're just consumers, but we have to be the inventors. We have to be the makers. We have to be the innovators, right? That's one. We have to have a model where so we're not saying that everybody, um, um, we're not saying that everyone, we want to be so tech savvy and we want to follow just what the big players are doing. We're not saying that, but we have to understand how it works so that we can make it work in our setting. We may not be able to make the kind of the large investments that these bigger brands overseas are, 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 are able to invest, but we need to understand the nuances of those business models so that we can now craft business models that work for us in our local context or our regional context. So we have some things to learn from the big boys, in other words, right? Um, we've already spoken about some of these traditional ways of doing things that are no factual in these bigger first world countries. We have to now return to looking at how we integrate some of these traditional ways of doing things, traditional ways of making fabric, traditional ways of weaving, jippy jacka, et cetera, because that now is part of our unique value proposition. One of the things I wanted to say as well, as we speak about bespoke, we have to understand the value of bespoke and we have to price it accordingly. I think in the past, when we talk about being able to go to the dressmaker and she makes us something that's so unique and no one else would have it, a lot of people think, oh, we can't have a dressmaker and she's not going to charge me no holy for money. We have to change that. Bespoke is high value. Bespoke is custom made. It means that you and you alone will have something like that. And so we have to, I think, I like to talk about the gift and craft sector, Ms. Ms. Mrs. Taylor, you know this. And I've always said that what we do in gift and craft in Jamaica is not mass produced business, it's high end business we do because we're doing them in limited amounts. So it's a niche market. And so part of what we have to do is to educate our consumers to understand the real value that these artisans and designers are creating. And so the price must be on par. So don't try to go to the, 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 the you know, a Sid Sills, for example, to go and barter about the, the, the nicely made straw bags, because we're not going to do it. We shouldn't do it. We shouldn't go to a beanie buds and say, oh, yeah, man, I just straw I'm making a Jamaica. No, we have to understand the value of bespoke, the amount of work, the time, the sustainable techniques that are used to create these materials. Those have to be underscored. And we have to help the consumers to understand that this is not just, you know, it's not mass produced. You know, it's handmade. I like to use the word handmade. And so there's a certain amount of value that comes with that. So I hope I answered your question, Mrs. Taylor. 
Thank you so much, Laura. And um, just to support what you're, what I'm hearing coming out is with value, high value and bespoke, there needs to be you now storytelling and demonstrating techniques, using, using the same social media platform with the same influencers to look at demonstrating the intricacies of putting that item together as part of the storytelling. Moses, I want to jump quickly to you because I know you have been buzzing in the chat and I've seen your hand. I want to know, um, Moses, pose your question or comment. All right. Uh, let me start with uh, Paul's presentation. For updates, um, the person who made their outfits, and I'm going to do some points. Okay. I want to thank all the co hosts co hosts All right. So, um, first of all, sustainability. Digital sustainability. Our universities, our fashion institute, need to look at um, digital fashion making, trading, mark making, illustration, 3D printing, sampling. Um, also oh, guys, uh, yes. Is, I'm not sure if your position is um is okay where the Wi-Fi is concerned because I am struggling to hear like it's breaking. So. I think we would have missed some rich points that you're using. Can you go again? Let me see if the Wi-Fi is stable. Okay, all right. So I mentioned about outfits, outfits um, that they ran in. So did did you get that point? So, so if I hear you, if you if I hear you correctly, you are you are speaking about the. The athletes and the, the actual the outfits that they wore. Yes, we got that. It, okay, so question was where they made it later. And then I'm going to just run through a few points. And um, I want to start with the sustainability aspect of it because um, digital is actually part of sustainability. Um, if, if, if we are doing illustration, we can do it on the computer and do a lot of is in, instead of using pencil and paper and marker. So the in, institutions in, in general, um, not want to single out Jamaica, need to look more into the digital aspect of pattern making, reading, marker making, illustration, 3D printing, 3D sampling, and looking at um, in the bespoke aspect now in terms of speed of production or manufacturing um, digitized equipment such as the later technology with the sewing equipment such as automatic thread trim, automatic um, back tack, and those other features. So those are my quick points that I want to, to make and looking forward to the, 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 the education system be transformed in for the digital aid using um, teaching card and all the digital aspects of it. All right, thank you. Thanks, Moses. And for persons who may not have been here, and I, I summarize that he's saying in the education aspect of it, he's looking forward to the integration of um, technology as a part of the education process and how they use technology to, to do the outputs the, the, this, from the design to the actual product. Um, Marvelin, Marvelin, I hope Sorry, I Janine, Janine. Yes, Robert. Sorry, just quickly, I just want to quickly respond to Moses. I won't be long, uh, just before Marvelin speaks. Um, so there, there are a couple of things that, just quickly, so he spoke about the issue of the athlete's outfit and who made them, right? So we need to understand that issue. So, so the athlete's outfit, I think, were made by Puma. We've had a very, very long relationship with Puma, I do believe, over the years. But there's something that we need to understand, and it's something that I think that goes over to our strategies, even when we talk about buy Jamaica, build Jamaica. We need to remember the issue of globality or the issue of that we live in a global world. And so we can't be going back to an archaic system in a contemporary world that basically um, identifies these global masses in terms of particular eras. Just like how in fashion, regardless of all the fashion that goes on across the world, really and truly, there are just about maybe, I think it's like about four, five, six um, mass entities that literally, literally own all the luxury houses that, that basically turn, literally decide what happens in the industry. I'm saying that to say, 
we do so we understand that basically big for us to act within the global space we have to be a part of that system which you now allows us in our words when you go to a puma factory an adidas factory a nike factory they have the system that are able to respond very quickly in terms of also research and technology in terms of getting our athletes to the kind of equipment that they need to be fine however we need to also now understand within those paradigms you now there are you know, these spaces that we begin to actually push our foot down and say a b c d or do we know even as a government because again we have these very good relationships and we need to understand our as a, as a nation and as a branding space we are very good for these brands we can go in there and ideate with them they have the machinery we ideate with them and so this is you now where we have to go back to the issue of one business strategy and also of um, business model. These are the ways that we're going to be able to transform the value. Not, not with their saying, oh, oh no, come off of this, make we make the close them. No. So we have to be, we have to know, begin to affirm that global space and begin to act because we are we have the business leaders here that can act anywhere. I mean, look at Grace moving on. Thanks so much, um, Robert. I am definitely in agreement with you. Where exactly in the value chain do we see ourselves? How are we going to go around the negotiation table to ensure that we are extracting value from the athletes um, appearing in the outfits? Not just to say they are made here, but could they be designed by a, a, a Jamaican designer? You know, so we're in it because we can't we can't compete with a Adidas or a Puma factory. Come on, but certainly we can add value to what it is they are showcasing, and I hear that. Um, Marvelin, and then we will take um, Tracyan after. Tracyan, you want to go ahead until maybe uh, Marvelin can sort out whatever issue is happening. Hello. Yes, much better, much better. Okay, hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I am new um, in, this, in this space. I am currently getting my business registered. I do oils and I have gotten um, an email to participate on this platform. I have the interest in doing bags and flippers um i have been listening to the various um presenter and this is an interest that i had a long time ago because i have been well i was introduced to this area from my father he was a um craft market vendor and he used to make his own items you know carving and stuff like that so and because I'm in the hair and nails, I have clients from various areas and I would normally get souvenirs and stuff for them. And I would design a lot of bags and slippers. So they are the one that, you know, told me to expand my interest. You know, persons on the platform is well advanced. I am just starting out and started to reach out to, which caused me to reach out to JBDC to get more knowledge and training um, in this area. And so I'm glad I'm, I have been able to participate on this forum, but I don't know if this forum is applied to me because I've heard person are actually so far, persons are well experienced in this area as I haven't started as yet. Well, don't worry yourself, Tracy, you have to start somewhere. And um, certainly it sounds like you are actually dabbling already in product development. And so it's from concept to market. So my recommendation is that nice gentleman on the screen there, Mr. Robert Hall, is one such contact at JBDC that you can start to have some conversation with to see how you can get into the action. So I'm happy that you are here and you are hearing the value that you could actually extract from this industry. Marvelin, I hope, yes, we are hearing. Go ahead, Marvelin. Good afternoon. Um, it's a, this is a whole lot of information for me and I really thank you ladies. But I have moved from Florida trying to set up a business, uh, factory because I see the value of Jamaicans sewing. I know it's here, it's hard to find, 
but I've been here over a year trying to do this handbag, clothing, shoes. And uh, the next thing is the other lady was talking about trying to stick with, with um, custom made. That is a hard thing to do because I've been doing it for years. And it's like, they look at you as a dressmaker. Don't care how you keep reminding them you're a designer. It, I know it depends on your clientele, but it's hard to get priced for your value. They want the best from you and they don't want to pay. So what I decided to do, I want to do manufacturing. And then the other lady from that, she was saying that was, wasn't really a good idea either, but I'm just here to learn. Okay, thanks, Marvely. Um, do any other questions have any any? All right, go ahead, Kina. So, um, what she said about um the custom, she she is right. It is difficult, and you you do feel sometimes as if they take you for a dressmaker, and they don't understand the process that goes into fashion designing and how technical it is. And that, I mean, I have I have customers who have come back to me with clothing that they have brought to a, a dressmaker realizing that interpreting what they want is very difficult if you're, if you're not properly trained and there is value in that so we have to price ourselves accordingly because you're giving your 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 delivering quality and i remember years ago i went i was by um courtney washington's boutique and he had closed during covid i had closed during covid to go online as well because that was the only way to go to survive and I remember going to Courtney Washington and he had a sign at the front of the boutique saying all custom designs start at 600 US dollars. So don't you dare come and waste my time unless you have 600 US dollars and it doesn't matter what you're designing. That is my fee because that's what my skill is worth. And I said to him, so that does not scare away customers. He said, it scare away the right ones, the ones who are going to waste your time. So the ones who who understand the value, they will still order and they will negotiate their price, but at least, you know, they understand the value of what you're offering. And I mean, it, 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 it is daunting to walk into a boutique and see that sign if you're, you know, you have a small budget, but it helps you to understand the value of what you're paying for. And I see Ramona laughing because she's familiar with that sign. Hi, Ramona. <laughs> Thanks, Kenya. And, um, and, Early in the discussion, you had raised the point about positioning. And I think it is the business bit, uh, around it that needs to be built out, uh, Marbley, that needs to be built out around what you're saying so that you don't have to be you know, haggering or trying to prove value. Sometimes it's not so much the design or the product, but the positioning and the business behind it, the way it is structured and the way we are communicating yeah, the with the market, with the target market. And one important point, which I think Kina was the one who raised it, is about demand-driven customization. So it was a very specific application, not making things as a customized item and then trying to sell it, but certainly listening to what the client is seeking to get as the output and then creating a response that interprets that and, and matching, matching that demand design request. Basically this customer has this image or this vision of something and you are the creative that brings it to life versus your own design coming to life and being made and then selling it as a customized item. So there are very specific applications to that kind of business model, which really speaks to the business and the strategy and the tactic. And Robert, I see you unmuted. You wanted to yes, add? Yes, um, just a quick point. I kind of um a slightly not slightly different issue, but we've we've kind of we not I haven't really focused on it this morning. But one of the things that I know that um, I kind of want to pose a question to Kenya um, of a sort, um, but like she had started some very, very important work pre-COVID. And what had happened was that she had um, spoken of the issue of, um, she had spoken of the issue of, so she, she, she and we, as we know, Kenya is very passionate about, um, about the industry. And, and basically she had started an initiative in terms of getting a guild started um, in terms of you no know, the designers coming together to own their space, and part of that you no know, was the training of um, training of seamstresses, and 
I'm bringing this forward because oftentimes, so we've spoken about the whole issue of training and training for the creative. But of course, having the machinery and there is, you know, Moses spoke about all this digital engagement, which is great. But then you also need the skills, those core skills that people spoke of internationally and are speaking of internationally. If it is that we don't connect to that relay in terms of you no know, preserving that space, aka regardless of how digital you get, you need to understand what a pattern looks like. You need to understand the concept of fit. You need to understand what construction is. You, are, you need to understand when the machine is off in terms of you know, producing the seam that you want or do not want. You have to decide what seam is appropriate. So even if the machine decides the seam, you now need to decide, no, I'm going to put that there or that there. So, um, Kenya, I don't mean to set you up or anything. Please. Oh, continue. no, you didn't. And I'm, I'm happy you brought it up. Thank you so much. So as, as Robert was saying, a few years ago, I mean, well, in 2000 and 2011, we started the Designers Guild and it was persons like Jolan and myself and other designers in the industry who saw what happened with the Jamaica Fashion Apparel Cluster through JBDC and PS and, and um, PSDP. The EU, yes. And we saw where a lot of the programs that the government put forward were always short-lived and they had like a three-year mandate. And after that, they lock up shop, they do their little assessment um, report and they're gone. And you're left wondering what is happening? What about us? What's going to happen now? And you're kind of left holding the bag and you wonder, you know, are they really in this to help the industry or is it just a tick box um, process where they have to do this to say they're doing something and you kind of become, you know, a bit jaded and you decide you want to do your own thing to focus on what the designers really need. And we saw where some of the projects that they were doing and focusing on weren't really servicing the industry in terms of what we really needed. We saw where manufacturing was an issue for most of the designers and there was no focus on that. Everything was focused on bringing designers overseas to showcase at trade shows and fashion week. And then guess what? When you went there and you got the orders, you can't manufacture it and people take you as a joke. So therefore, until we fix the root and make sure we have a team of seamstresses ready to manufacture who are skilled and trained, we, we, we're going to have a problem. So in 2015, we started, we, 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 um, we started a, a series of seminars and then we eventually announced that we were going to have a mass training program where we were going to train seamstresses to, 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 to service the industry. And we put out an announcement and we had over 300 people applying to be part of the training program. It was a free training program. And uh, we were able to train one batch of 50. And we had to stop halfway through the training because we teamed up with the University of Technology to use their sewing department because we didn't have a space. We don't have a space. And uh, they eventually needed the space because something else was happening and they had something with students and it was very difficult to maneuver the schedules and we had to put a pause on the program and, and I think that was 2018 and then it was delayed and then COVID happened and then we had to delay it further. Um, one of the trainers was she was ill and it was just, we had, we had several issues where we had to delay it and we still have persons who had signed up for the program, who call us, are you going to restart the program? I really want to finish. I had so much fun learning pattern making and garment construction. And, you know, it, it was their only chance because they, the persons we had doing the training program were, were, were well-trained, well-skilled. Um, one of one of them was, was Mrs. Carr from UTEC who actually teaches at UTEC and she is phenomenal. And we want to restart the program, but our problem is we need a space. Now, even with, um, for, for we, in 2019, before we had shut down, I had just expanded the boutique to set up a factory. And my plan was to use the space on weekends when my staff would not be there for the training program, because that's what we're doing with UTEC, using the space on weekends. And COVID happened and we had to shut down the space. And we have all that sewing machine now sitting in storage. So if we have a space where we can set up or a space where we can access machines, we have the trainers and the persons ready to train. We just don't have the space. And rent and electricity is quite, you know, high. So that is our setback. So if, if JBDC can partner with us to provide a space, you know, we would greatly appreciate it. And Kenya, it would help fix a huge part of the, you know, deficit in the industry. 
Kenya, let's talk. Let's talk. <laughs> let's definitely let's talk. And I mean, this that forum is generation. helping us to understand what some other. Yes. Other we don't. We don't are. need fashion shows. We don't need fashion shows. We don't. Getting a market is easy. What we need is the manufacturing. We need to be able to produce. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the international market, they're realizing the talent we have and they're sending people to Jamaica to train people and they're not going to train them and keep them. They're going to, they're going to take them out of the country. Right. So we're still going to be at a deficit. Right. But so mm -hmm. we need to, we need to realize what they have realized. We have skills and talents in Jamaica that is world renowned. We just need to, we need to nurture it. We need to believe in ourselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, or fortunately, I'm not so sure, we are out of time. Wow. <laughs> However, the dialogue will continue, the steps, the actions, the responses will continue because we're at JBDC, we're really not just about talk. We want to share the knowledge, yes, but we want to see how we can transition now in some tangible actions. Can I hear the call for, for action? Um, there's also the call for the education response. So Miriam, yes. I know you are hearing. And so we have some really strong points to move. I want to say so much appreciation to our panelists for sharing their expertise and knowledge. Without you, we would not know how to make the first step. And so we are very appreciative. Kenya, Robert, Laura, Miriam, and unfortunately, Donovan was not able to join us through some technical difficulties, but his points that he sent in are aligned to what has been discussed about the culture, the branding, and the sustainable approaches to addressing some of the challenges. And so it's our heartiest appreciation. Please, on behalf of the JBDC, accept our appreciation for your input. Oh, um, no, 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 no. Thank you to the panelists. Um, thank you to the participants, rather, for their engagement. I am certainly hoping that the information was rich and useful. <laughs> And it's, it's really, it's not going to be an overnight thing. It's definitely not going to be a two-year, three-year thing. But we are certainly going to be pushing that this industry is going to be a reality and a force in the global market space. We have all the right ingredients. We just need to put them together and come up with some serious strategies for implementation. And so, ladies and gentlemen, it was my pleasure to moderate, I will just make sure that I use some of the keywords that came out in this discussion, sustainability, positioning, target market, branding, storytelling, merging old techniques with new technology, high value markets, demand driven production, customization, technology at just not just at the consumer end, but at the production end, exposing your techniques and doing the storytelling through technology and at the design end, the need for the education system and the, the various approaches. And I saw earlier, Miriam, you said um, skills training at all levels, at all aspects along the value chain. So it is, it is going to take other educational institutions to collaborate around the industry. Collaboration as well um, with expert artisans and new newbies to the industry, bottling the intangible asset of the Jamaican spirit. We still don't figure out that magic yet, but we, we're getting there. And of course, ensuring that at the end of the day, revenues are earned through strategic market access strategies. Ladies and gentlemen, it was my pleasure. My name is Janine Taylor. And on behalf of the JBDC, we thank you for joining us today and we wish you a great day. See you. Thank you. Thank you. It was very fruitful. All Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Kenya. Bye-bye. Bye, Robert. Laura, see you guys.